Welcome back to the podcast, Unbinding the Bible. This is episode 12, Eden's Garden Temple. And in this episode, I don't have a particular passage in mind that I would like to talk about. Instead, what I want to do is pull together a few of the themes that have already surfaced in previous podcast episodes, some that I have alluded to um, already, uh, some of the particular themes. But in this podcast, what I would like to do is try my best to tie all of those together and explicitly state some of the things that I have been simply alluding to so far to this point in the podcast. And so I'm really excited for this. This is something that I began to first study about 10 years ago. It has radically shaped my understanding of how I understand who I am as a human being, what my role is as a Christian, and ultimately what I see the role of the church to be as we attempt to live out our union with Jesus, the true temple, and how we express that in the world. And so I'm hoping to bring you along for that same ride. We certainly will not exhaust this topic, but I'm very, very excited to introduce you more accurately to Eden's Garden Temple. Thanks for joining. Here we go. In previous podcast episodes, we've talked a little bit about the four rivers that flow from the garden and rivers tending in our world at least to flow downhill we made some observations that the garden most likely was on top of a mountain and then you also remember from episode 11 that we began to look at some of the role of human beings in the garden to work the ground and keep it are also the same two verbs often used to describe the role of priests in the temple and if i go back even to another episode or a different point in another episode where we talked about these rivers flowing from Eden and listing places like, or things rather like gold, delium, and onyx stone. Um, You remember we talked about gold being things that you use for currency, but also things that you overlay onto things that you build to make them beautiful, to make them um, reflective and, and something that is precious and valuable. But delium and onyx stone, delium being these perfumes and um, things used for incense, and then onyx stone were in fact um, things used for, for bowls or other pottery vessels. And when we begin to describe these things, you can look at them from the standpoint of being necessary elements for human societies to flourish. And we looked a little bit at that. You need gold or monetary things to exchange and to trade, but you have perfumes and essential oils and and traditional medicine and things of that sort. And then you have pottery and, you know, items to eat food in in your homes. But those three things, gold, um, perfumes, and pottery vessels and bowls are also three kinds of things used to describe the work of of a priest and the role of a priest in the temple um, and in the tabernacle. There were often pans and items to use for under the sacrifices and incense was to be burning at all times in the tabernacle and certain perfumes were made that were always um, burning so that you smelled a particular aroma every time you were in the temple and so much of the temple was covered in gold. And so even the way these items are described for us, they're not only communicating things about the natural world, they are communicating things about temples. And so what I want to do just for this particular episode is to talk to you a little bit about what life was like in the ancient Near East and how the way Genesis 1 and 2 is told to us is communicating some powerful things about temples and about gardens and the relationship between the two. Um, In the ancient Near East, which is simply a, a term and a way to describe the kind of culture that was around Israel at the time of the Old Testament. So when I refer to the ancient Near East, 
That is simply a way of describing the kinds of things that any Israelite living at the time that the Old Testament was written would have known about certain practices and certain ways of life of the nations around them. And one of the common practices of the nations around Israel was that when any one of their kings or their their nations, their gods, if you will, would have conquered another nation and come in and, and set up their own rule and their own governance in a new land, one of the very first things that would have ever been done is that the people there would have erected a temple in the name of their God who had just given them victory, has just provided rest and peace for them by conquering the chaos of the opposing nation's um, domain, if you will, and they would set up a temple in worship to their God. They would create an image of their God, an idol, if you will, and erect it in the temple so that it would be this embodiment in their temple, in their sacred space, an image, a picture, a representative of the God who just gave them all victory over their enemies. And the God himself embodied in that idol would then take up residence in this sacred space. He would sit on his throne and he would rule from a place of rest over his newly conquered place, his newly conquered kingdom. And this was just a common practice. In fact, it's not too far of a stretch. It's not really a stretch at all to say that this is exactly what Israel does when the Lord God sends them into Canaan to drive out the the nations who were there before them. David ultimately is the one, as one of Israel's most famous kings, to bring rest to the land, which is spoken about repeatedly in the book of First Samuel and then again in Second Samuel, he brings rest to the land and then offers to build the Lord a house, a temple. And the Lord God tells him that he has shed too much blood and that he is not the one to build a house for him, but that his David's son Solomon will be the one to build a house. And so the book of First Kings alludes to or doesn't allude to it, it tells us that Solomon builds the house of the Lord and he sets up this temple, this place where the Lord is going to dwell. But we're we're getting outside of Genesis. My, My point in bringing all this up is to say, do you recognize a pattern between the way these kings would conquer a people, set up a temple, let their God rest on his throne in their temple, set up an idol that would embody the image of the God in the temple, and then be able to take place in the worship of their God for giving them victory over the chaos of their enemies while residing in the temple and doing the work of the temple. This is exactly what we have in Genesis 1 and Genesis 2. Except instead of one king coming and conquering one other king's place or his land, the Lord God comes in and through an, a powerful demonstration of his grace and his kindness simply brings order and rest to the entire world He brings order and he brings rest through defeating the chaos and the darkness, the darkness uh, over the face of the deep. He separates light from dark. He separates day from night. He separates dry land from the waters. He separates the waters below from the waters above. He puts plants and animals and human beings. He puts birds and fish and creeping, crawling creatures and, and garden plants to provide food for all of these people. And then what does he do? He creates an image of himself that he places in this garden, which is the smallest representation of the type of rest and peace that he has just given to the whole world. And then in chapter 2, it says that he rests on the seventh day from all his work. He takes up residence in his space. 
with his image bearer there, who is his representative of the of the the conquering rule and the 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 bringing of peace and rest that the Lord God just got finished bringing to the world. And we looked at in the past with Psalm 48, looking at the Lord as a fortress, seeing him described as this great sanctuary. We read in Exodus chapter 15 that the Lord God took the people of Israel and planted them in his holy abode on his holy mountain. And all through the ancient Near East, and Israel is no exception, temples erected to the gods that the people are worshiping, or the temple in Israel erected to the Lord God whom the people were worshiping, were always erected on mountaintops. Mountaintops in the ancient Near East, the way people thought about the landscape of the world, the way they thought about the skies and how the heavens interacted with the earth, it was viewed in the ancient Near East, not in a way that you and I today would see as scientifically accurate, but nonetheless, it was a way that they understood the world to be. And many of them at the time believed that the skies, the heavens, if you will, was like a giant canopy, kind of like a tent covering. It sort of formed a dome. And the mountain peaks were these giant pillars, these giant places that reached way up and more or less upheld this canopy, just like tent pegs or tent um, pillars might do if you were erecting a tent at a campsite. Those mountain peaks were the places where the earth touched the heavens. Those mountain peaks were the places where the gods or God would come down to dwell with mankind. And so mountain tops were always the places where temples or sanctuaries to the gods were erected because that was the place to believed to be where you could get the closest to the heavens of any other place on the earth. And as we looked at with Genesis 2, 10 to 14, knowing that rivers are flowing out of Eden, Eden, in fact, is a garden on top of a mountain. It's on top of a hill. In the garden, you have an image of the God who just brought order and rest to the entire world And he places his image in his garden to work it and to keep it. The same two verbs used to describe the role of the priests in Israel's later construction of their tabernacle and the worship that took place in the tabernacle while they were wandering in the wilderness. And then once David brought rest to the promised land for the people, They erected a permanent structure. Solomon erected it, actually, and it was called the temple. The temple, the place where the image would be set up representative of the God. And of course, one of the Ten Commandments, if you know, is that Israel was forbidden to make idols or images of their God to be worshipped in any way. Why? Because the Israelites themselves were the image. They were the image of their God planted on God's holy abode so that they could worship him and draw the rest of the world into understanding what it means to know the Lord God, to be made in his image, and to act as his image bearers having dominion over the earth. Now, recognizing the Garden of Eden as the very first temple is actually really, really important for a number of reasons. Um, First of all, it helps us make the most sense of why certain language is used throughout the Bible when referring to places where trees are there and shade is provided, as I've alluded to in previous episodes, as well as places of streams of living water in barren places.
because in Genesis chapter 3, at the very end of the chapter, once the fall has taken place and Adam and Eve um, have been driven out of the garden, is the word that is used in Genesis 3.24. Allow me actually to just read this. It says that the Lord God drove out the man, and at the east of the garden of Eden he placed the cherubim and a flaming sword that turned every way to guard the way to the tree of life. And that's how Genesis 3 ends, and it's, it's, it really ends on a downer, but it ends by explaining now that the role of guarding and keeping has been given to the cherubim, these fierce living creatures, these angelic um, creatures with multiple wings, and, and um, are there basically used to guard the entrance back into this kind of place. And so you have a garden, you have a place where flowers are there, trees are there, water sources are there, um, there are many, many trees in the garden, so it's kind of like a, a woodsy type of a place. Well, what's really, really interesting, and I've alluded to this already, is that when David requested to build the Lord a house, build him a sanctuary, build him a temple, after he had provided rest for all the land, which would have been customary in the ancient Near East to do for the God who gave you that rest, the Lord God tells David that he is not the one to build him the temple, but that Solomon will in fact do it, David's son. And so I actually misspoke in a previous episode, but it is in 1 Kings chapter 6 where the construction of the temple is, is given to us. 1 Kings 8 is a beautiful prayer that Solomon gives in choosing to dedicate this temple to the Lord. And there are many, many beautiful things to be found in that prayer. I'm not going to take the time to look at that yet because what I want to do is focus our attention a little bit on 1 Kings 6. On the description of the temple itself that Israel was called to build. And here's, I just want to read a handful of verses from 1 Kings chapter 6. Again, I always read from the ESV. If you have a Bible, you can follow along. But in verse 15 um, of chapter 6, it says that Solomon lined the walls of the house on the inside with boards of cedar. From the floor of the house to the walls of the ceiling, he covered them on the inside with wood, and he covered the floor of the house with boards of cypress. Verse 18 says, The cedar within the house was carved in the form of gourds and open flowers. All was cedar. No stone was seen. Now I want to stop there for just a second. But if you listen to this description, the, the temple itself was covered entirely on the inside with wood so that all you saw was lumber. All you saw was woods. All you saw was the evidence of being surrounded by the very thing that comes from trees. Sounds a little bit like a garden. And actually having carved into that wood in the form of gourds and open flowers sounds to me even more like a garden. And yet it continues. Verse 29, around all the walls of the house, he carved engraved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers in the inner and outer rooms. Verse 32, he covered the two doors of olive wood with carvings of cherubim, palm trees, and open flowers. Verse 35, on them he carved cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, and he overlaid them with gold, evenly applied on the carved work. Now, when you have gourds, palm trees, open flowers, and cherubim all across the inside of an entirely wooded temple, what are you encouraging the people worshiping and serving there to think about? You are encouraging them to think about a garden. It was beautiful on the inside. It was glorious on the inside. This is a time and, and a reminder of a time when man dwelt with God perfectly in a garden. 
And so I'm not making things up when I say the point of redemption, the point of the promise to Abraham, and the point of what Israel as a nation was supposed to be and to do is always aimed at restoring mankind, humanity, all of us, back to what life was like in the garden. Jesus ultimately does this better than anyone. And yet the way the temple was built reminded the people there was once a time when we lived with our God, unhindered, in a garden. And one of my favorite passages actually is from the book of Leviticus, and it reminds me of the section in Genesis 3, which we haven't yet gotten to, but I have referred to it before, that being the time that the Lord God walks um, in the garden in the cool of the day. Um, but he does say that in um, in verse 11 of chapter 26 in Exodus, it, or I'm sorry, in Leviticus, it says this, I will make my dwelling among you, and my soul shall not abhor you. And I will walk among you and will be your God, and you shall be my people. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, that you should not be their slaves. And I have broken the bars of your yoke and made you walk erect. Now Leviticus is right on the heels as the passage indicates that Israel has recently been saved from slavery in Egypt where they where they were hunched over they were in an oppressive state but this is one of the first times after the garden where this reference to the Lord God walking with his people shows up again and it does so because he's interested in bringing them out of places of slavery and bondage or in the way the Bible often describes places of wilderness and barrenness and dryness and parched lands and death and bring them back to a place where he will make his dwelling among them. The word for dwelling is the Hebrew word for tabernacle. That's all that tabernacle means. It's a dwelling place. And so when Jesus comes, and in John chapter 1, John refers to him, it says, And the word was made flesh, and he made his dwelling among us. It's the same word again. The word became flesh and made his dwelling. He made his tabernacle among us. Jesus himself is the one, and Jesus himself is the way that the Lord God makes his dwelling among his people. Of course, when Leviticus 26 is written, we're ultimately going to see a forward momentum toward the actual tabernacle, toward the actual temple. And there's a ton to be explored as to why the Lord God chose to meet with his people in a place that they built. But even in the ways that the temple is described and how it is erected, it's oftentimes alluding back to the same way that the Lord God chose to create the heavens and the earth, to create the garden, to take the man, to put him there, to work it and to keep it, to act as his priestly kings. And so as we read the book of Genesis, we have to keep these themes in mind. We have to ask ourselves questions like, why on earth would a priest even be needed? And again, we don't have to read beyond chapter 3 to find out exactly why. To know what the first priestly kings failed to do in failing to rule well and then choosing to redefine what ruling well actually means and then also failing to work the ground and to keep it. Failing in their role as priests and then redefining good and evil in such a way that turning in on oneself is now actually the ultimate good. And the difficulty that surfaces when mankind decides to make those kinds of decisions. But with a temple garden, the imagery is that the earth is now the footstool of, of the Lord. And in Isaiah 66, he flat out says that. Heaven is my throne and the earth is my footstool. Well, what does that mean? What that means is the entire creation is God's temple. This little itty bitty spot in the creation, this garden in Eden is a small representation of 
of what is already owned and already ruled by the Lord God himself. And his image bearer, mankind, is placed in this small representation of the fullest picture so that he too can learn to rule it, to govern it, and to work it, and to keep it on God's behalf as the Lord God himself would if he were there. And so you have this interplay constantly between the fact that the Lord God himself has his throne is in heaven and the earth is his footstool. It's as if the entire universe is this holy of holies, this fantastic place where the Lord resides and he dwells and he rules. And that is correct. And then you have this small little garden in a place called Eden where there is a water source, trees bearing fruit, supplying the needs for man. And the Lord's image, his idol, is placed in the garden to work it and keep it as his priest, worshiping him, serving him, inviting others in to be a part of what is happening. And so when Jesus comes in the Gospels, and in John chapter 2, which is probably the most famous um, example of what's going on here, um, it, it, we're told in John chapter 2 that Jesus comes into the temple and he sees those selling oxen and sheep and pigeons and the money changers sitting there. He makes a whip of cords and it says in verse 15 of John 2, he drove them all out of the temple with the sheep and oxen. And he poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. And he told those who sold the pigeons, let take these things away. Do not make my father's house a house of trade. So the Jews said to him, what sign do you show us for doing these things? Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I will raise it up. The Jews then said, it's taken us 46 years to build this temple and you will raise it up in three days? But he was speaking about the temple of his body. When therefore he was raised from the dead, his disciples remembered that he had said this and they believed the scripture and the word that Jesus had spoken. Now, the verb that John uses to describe what Jesus does to these money changers is he drove them out. Fascinatingly enough, it's the exact same word used in Genesis 3.24 for what the Lord God did to the man at the end of Genesis 3. He drove him out of the garden. So what is happening now is that these people, these religious leaders, they feel that, that they earned the right to be back in the presence of God. They feel like they earned the spot to be back in Eden, but because they are not viewing it as a place of flourishing, they are not viewing Eden, they are not viewing their temple as a place of inclusion, of inviting others in. They're using it as a way to keep people out. They're using it as a way to make themselves rich. Jesus does the same thing to them that the Lord God did to the first man and the first woman in the first temple. He drives them out. And if you read the story from the, from the book of Genesis all the way through the Old Testament, you hear this concept of driving out, driving out, driving out, driving out over and over and over again. It's used some 60 plus times throughout the Old Testament. The first half of which are used to describe what Israel is going to do in driving out the nations that the Lord God said deserve to be driven out of the land that he has promised to give to Abraham and to his descendants. But once the people of Israel get into that land and drive out their enemies, they find that they are also failing to know what it means to live back in a perfect place with God. And so through the prophets, the Lord God begins to tell the people, I will drive you out. And throughout the Bible, there's a combination of this idea of death. In the day that you eat of it, you will surely die and being driven away from the presence of the Lord. Those concepts are often used interchangeably they will speak of Israel's exile from their own land at the, at the hands of Assyria and then at the hands of Babylon. Jesus drives out those who are mishandling 
the presence and beauty of God in their temple by not allowing others to enter that should have been there, turning his temple into a house of trade. But on and on and on it goes. The garden temple is what every other temple that will ever be erected is always alluding back to. And so we can take what we know about gardens, what we know about temples, what we know about priests, and what we know about what it means to be made in the image of God. And we begin, can begin to put categories together in our minds to be able to understand ultimately why Jesus as the true temple, as the true priest, expresses himself to the world and to God's people the way that he does. And as I shared in the introduction, this has greatly helped me to understand my own role as someone who is in Christ, where Paul speaks of the church as the temple of the Holy Spirit, the whole church, where Paul says that we are growing in to a dwelling place for God by the Spirit in Ephesians chapter 2. And so go look at some of those passages this week. Go look at 1 Corinthians 3, 1 Corinthians 6, Ephesians chapter 2, 1 Peter chapter 2 to begin to wrap your mind around just who it is that we have been called to be as Christians and what that means to be redeemed back to human beings made in the image of God by the very one who is the perfect representation of God's image. So I know this was quite a bit of a, of a rushed thing. I hope you were able to track with me a little bit. As always, if you have any questions, feel free to email me, unbindingthebible at gmail.com. But that's all for this week. See you next time.